What we have to do as parents is to help our young people understand the decision based on in-state tuition versus out-of-state. That can be the difference between nine grand in-state and 45 grand out-of-state. We can't leave young people to make that decision alone. And we've got to stop this trend of young people walking into a financial aid office to sign documents they don't understand or payments they can't afford. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait for you to hear today's show because I am sitting down with the legendary Chris Hogan. Now, I'm sure you already know who Chris is. You probably listened to his show, The Chris Hogan Show. He's a part of the Dave Ramsey Network. I mean, he has been in this game for quite some time, making one of the biggest differences out there, especially because he is a two-time two-time number one national best-selling author. I just got done reading his book, actually, Everyday Millionaires, How Ordinary People Built Extraordinary Wealth, and I love it. And the thing I love is this. He and his team did the single biggest study on millionaires and how they got there and how they think. They studied over 10,000 millionaires. And everything they learned, that's what we are about to talk about in this episode. So you're going to love it because we talk about everything from should we be taking the conservative route and saving, 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 or should we be an entrepreneur and take a couple of risks? How do we know what gurus to listen to? How does he want his kids to think about money when they grow up? All of the expert hacks, including if you feel like you just got your butt kicked financially by COVID or any other situation, what exactly you can do in order to get yourself pointed in the right direction. And you're going to love what I ask him if I think that anyone, and I mean anyone, can become a millionaire. I think you're going to find his answer very interesting. Now, listen, speaking of becoming a millionaire, we don't all have that goal, but many of us do. Whatever your financial goal is, I want to remind you that I took every single thing that I had to learn in order to become financially independent, and I put it into my course, The Money Principles. If you want to check it out, you can go to thetruthaboutmoney.com, or if you want to take the shortened, free, four-video version of it, you can go to fortheloveofmoney.com, forward slash free. Again, go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash free for free video lessons on how you need to think and behave with your money that I promise you will make a big difference. Go check it out, fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash free. All right, get ready because this episode that you're about to hear is one of my favorite episodes that I have ever done. So listen up, take notes, because here we go. All right, Chris Hogan, welcome to the show. This is definitely my privilege. How are you doing? I am doing well. I'm glad to be with you. So I always kick my show off with rapid fire. It's a fun way for my listeners to get to know you in a hurry. And if something really good comes up, I promise we'll circle back around and do a deep dive on it. You in? Okay, I think I'm ready. All right, I'll All right. start real easy. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Kentucky. And where do you live now? Uh, uh, Franklin, Tennessee. Ah, I have so many friends in Franklin. It's crazy. Okay, that'll be a different subject later. The whole topic of rapid fire, you've got me second guessing where I live. <laughs> I'm going to do better. Come on, come on. All right, all right. Here's the next one. You ready? Favorite yeah. quote. Oh, favorite quote. If it is to be, it's up to me. Robert oh. Schuller. Yes, one of your yeah. superpowers. What's that? Oh, my superpowers, I've, I've got to say, is encouragement. Mm, for sure. What is one of your all-time favorite accomplishments so far? Oh, being a dad. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, you know, my wife and I have been married 15 years this August. Not a dad yet. Getting around to it ASAP. All right. Very good. One thing you're challenged by right now. Oh, challenged by life and dealing with change. Mm -hmm. Boy, I think that's a constant. Yeah. Uh, something generous you've done recently. Oh, uh, gifting my time and talent. Uh, spending it with other entrepreneurs that are trying to grow their business during this tough time. And uh, just talking with them and, and trying to love on them as much as possible. Oh, I love that. That definitely is generous. And last but not least, what are you grateful for today? Oh, man, I'm grateful for the opportunity to get better, right? Regardless of where we are right now, it doesn't have to be where we end up if we don't let it. So we get to choose. So I'm grateful for improvement. Oh, you and me both. Okay, so let's get a little bit deeper into the interview now. And I'd love to start with taking you back to your first job right out of college. Okay. I think it was a bill collector. Am I right? 
Uh, actually, I was coaching uh, full time right out of college uh, while going to grad school. Okay. So where did the bill collecting come in? The bill collecting came in after I got my master's and coached another year. Then I started with a consumer finance company uh, where we gave out loans at the beginning of the month, but I got to collect at the end. You talk <laughs> about a shell shocker, buddy. That was a, that was a mind blower. Oh my gosh. Okay. I can't imagine the insight that you got at that early age into people's financial habits. What did you learn about people and money right out of the gates in that job? Well, I mean, first and foremost, that it, it didn't matter how much you made mm -hmm. uh, because we saw people come in from all income statuses and all types of jobs, but it was that people were struggling to deal with money. Yeah. And so it was very eye-opening for me at a young age to learn this. It's funny. When I was younger in my career, I worked at a consumer finance company and bank as well. And I remember, remember when I would take applications and pull credit, I realized the same thing over the first couple of years of working there. It didn't matter what you made. You're, it did not quite determine your financial situation. There were people that were making so much money that were in debt up to their ears. And there were people that had a very meager or modest um, salary and they had tons of assets. Yes. Yeah. It is crazy because you can't assume anything. And money is one of these things that if you don't learn how to deal with it, it already knows how to deal with you. And so Don Maxwell's quote of, you either tell money where to go or you get to wonder where it went. Uh, that was a quote that I learned years later, but it's so relevant in that time. And even when I moved into in transition into mainstream banking, more of the same, people dress nicer, people making higher incomes, but you still had a whole lot of debt and a whole lot of need for loans even at that time. So what about age were you when you were uh, in collect bill collecting? Uh, it's, this was around 23 years old. Okay. So seeing that end of money, always asking people, what's wrong you know, uh, with the fact that you weren't able to make your payments? Can you make a payment? Can you make a half? A Did that create any viewer vision around money that you had to later uh, break or did that start to empower you? Well, I think if anything, it opened my eyes to, it wasn't a matter of income level. Right. It was that it, people had a need for it uh, and there was an appetite for debt. Uh, as I look back, I can see it much more clearly now. But I can tell you this, when you sit in the family rooms with people uh, and you're talking to them about making a payment or whatever, and you hear about a sick child or a job loss, it was a mind shift for me. It was an eye opener because they weren't just an account number and phone number and a dollar amount now. These were people. And sitting across talking to people, you could see the emotions of the life that they were dealing with. And so it gave me a lot of clarity and a lot more empathy as I dealt with people moving forward. Do you think that that's one of the reasons that you do what you do today? Oh, I, I firmly believe so. I, I firmly believe that even as I travel now and speak all around the country or used to until this COVID yeah. situation, right? But for me, as I go out and I talk, when I talk about statistics or I'm talking about something, I'm recalling a story, right? I'm recalling an individual that I either coached or worked with or someone I met at an event, but I can also see it on people's eyes. When I'm from stage, I can see it. I can feel the hurt. I can feel the desire. And so when I do it, I do it with a lot of passion and energy because I want to reach people. I want to help people turn that light switch on where they start to see things differently and believe more importantly that where they are right now doesn't have to be where they end up. Mm, I love that. What do you think is holding people back the most right now financially? Fear. Explain. I, I would say there are two things. Fear, number one, fear of change. I think that holds people back. Fear of the unknown. Uh, lack, fear of lack of knowledge, of not growing, or asking the question they've always wanted to ask. I think those things are big. The other thing holding people back is debt. Mm -hmm. Right, that four-letter word is doing more damage across our nation than we've ever imagined. Uh, you know, from and I'm talking all the way from credit card debt all the way up to student loan debt, uh, where we've got 1.7 trillion dollars right now in student loan debt, impacting close to 44, 47 million Americans. This is a serious epidemic that's impacting people's ability to not only provide for their families day to day, but to also be able to build wealth for the future. Let's talk about the student loan crisis for a moment. What's the solution? Well, I think the solution is education. And by that, what I mean, we've got to educate parents to be able to understand that student loans have become this way of life and it doesn't have to be, right? To be able to, to educate young people to help them understand how to count. You know, we've got young people picking schools based on a mascot or a sports team, having no idea that they're taking on 50, 60, uh, 100,000 a year in student loan debt. 
uh, to be slapped with this reality at the end of the day. What we have to do as parents is to help our young people understand the decision based on in-state tuition versus out-of-state. That can be the difference between nine grand in-state and 45 grand out-of-state. We can't leave young people to make that decision alone. And we've got to stop this trend of young people walking into a financial aid office to sign documents they don't understand or payments they can't afford. And so I think the education side of that is huge. We're trying to do this when we're with our foundations curriculum where we're educating young people on how money works, right? It's not a skill that's taught in school, but everyone has to deal with money once you graduate. Where can people find that, by the way? They can go, it's at DaveRamsey.com. They can click on foundations. Right now, we're in 52% of the high schools across the country, uh, but we're also developing, a, there's a middle school curriculum, high school, and even college. Uh, to give young people the skills on how did they av- deal with money properly, but what to avoid. I'm tired of hearing the stories of young people graduating with 150000 in student loan debt, and then they go out and get a car payment, and then they buy a house because they're trying to keep up with their friends. They're starting off life inside of a 10-foot hole, and it's going to take them years to dig out from. So if we can prevent this and then help the people that are in that situation dig out, then we can start to make a change in this country. Wow. Okay. You just brought up something that's a hot topic for me. And that is rushing out to buy a house because your parents told you it's the best investment you'll ever make. I mean, there's almost shame around if you're renting too long or if you don't rush out and buy a house as soon as your friends do. And what I always teach humbly is that that's not necessarily the right advice. You know, rush out, buy a home as, as fast as you can. It's going to be the best investment you ever make. As a matter of fact, I hope it's not, meaning there's some, some better opportunities out there. Right. What's your take on this pressure to buy a home right away? I think it's absurd. I think, you know, my coach taught me years ago, I had some incredible athletic coaches back in the day, but one of my coaches, I'll never forget, he said, good, better, best, mm-hmm. right? Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is your best. Uh, and I love that, that phrase, but I, I, I look through the lens now of good, better, and best. And as far as timing, right? There's a good time to do something. There's a better time and there's a best time. And I think when it comes to buying homes, this is a decision you want to make when you understand what you're dealing with. I want you to do that once you've got yourself out of debt, once you've built up a fully funded emergency fund, and you've got a down payment to put down on this home. And so, you know, you need to be in the home for three to five years for it to make sense, uh, not just running out and doing it because family members that have opinions drive me insane, right? When they cause young people to run out and do something before they're prepared, because the family member is not going to help you make a payment. So what I want you to do is slow down. And yeah, home ownership is a good thing, but I want it to be a blessing, not a curse. So you have to be smart about how you go about it. So there's a lot of pressure out there by certain associations that may, you know, receive commissions from home purchasing and all that saying, you know, get an FHA loan or get this type of loan with 3% down or 5% down. How do we know what we should be putting down and that we're actually making a smart home purchase? That's a great question. There are so many products out there with so many different little versions and all of this. Um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I like, I advise people on half for years, minimum of a 10% down payment. Okay. I'd love for you to go in with a 20% down payment to avoid PMI, private mortgage insurance, which all that does is protect the lender. It doesn't protect you. Mm-hmm. And it can add 150 to $500 a month to your payment. And so if you deal with an FHA loan, you're going to have PMI for the life of the loan moving forward. You can't get rid of it. So going conventional, a conventional 15-year fixed rate mortgage with 10% down to me is the best plan. That's the sign that, okay, you're ready for home ownership. Yeah. And I say that once you get yourself out of debt. Now, people will start to twitch when I say that, Chris. Okay. They'll say, wait a minute, Hogan, you don't understand. I've got, I've got 20,000 in credit card debt and I've got two car loans. I'm like, yeah, I hear you. Let's stay focused and attack and pay it off before you add this obligation as in a mortgage to your situation. Let's clean up the mess and prepare yourself for the future. And so I, I think, Chris, it boils down to this. In our society today, we want to wish and hope right? We want to wish stuff to happen. Now I'm old enough, but I'm going to use a reference here to date me. The show, I Dream of Jeannie. Okay. You're much too young. You're much too young for that. We might be close to the same age, actually. But you remember in that show, she would blink and stuff would just happen. Well, unfortunately in life, that's not how it goes. We actually have to work, which means we've got to sacrifice. We've got to give up some stuff to get some things that are better. And I think cleaning up our messes right now and saving up that down payment paves the way for you to not just buy a home, but to eventually own that bad boy, which is the goal. 
Oh man, I love that. Okay, I'm loving this conversation so far. I want to take it to a different place now. I've read one of your two books, Everyday Millionaires. Great book, by the way. Everyone needs to read it. And I want to start with this concept of the everyday millionaire. Now, you and your team, you did the largest study ever, over 10,000 millionaires. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay, so based on that study, do you believe that any single person out there, no matter where they started, can end up a millionaire? I, without a shadow of a doubt, believe that anyone, and I don't care where you came from, where you grew up, type of family, anyone can has the opportunity to become an everyday millionaire. It really boils down to you making a decision, you growing your knowledge, and you taking the steps to put you there. And inside the book, you're right, not only did we do the largest study that's ever been done, but we also have the stories. And I'm going to tell you, the stories in there are my favorite part. Uh, because you get to hear stuff from people that came from less than nothing. I'm talking about being homeless, but eventually getting on their feet and moving in the right direction. So it just tells me the American dream is alive and available, more importantly, to anyone that decides to pursue it. I love that. And so I want to actually quote, um, I've read that you, and then I, I quote, as a black man raised by a single parent in Kentucky, that becoming a millionaire seemed as far away as the stars. So oh. my question is like, what age or what moment did you believe that you too could become one? You know what? It was many years later. I can tell you growing up in Kentucky, sitting on the front porch, watching cars go by and hoping and wishing, you know, that one day that's my car. I'm going to have a car like that. Um, in my mind growing up, in order to become a millionaire, you had to be a pro athlete. You had to be a musician. You had to do something famous or big in order to get there. Uh, it was only many, many years later where I understood and, and reading books and understanding that, no, it's more about how you deal with money, yeah. right? And when you get yourself out of debt, that's why I see that as the number one threat. When you get yourself out of debt, what you do is pave the way for you to be able to build. And building and growing money is necessary. And so it was many years later, but I, I put the book out because I wanted to help people change their perspective. So many people believe you have to inherit it in order to become a millionaire. Uh, so many people believe you have to go to a fancy school. And I debunk all those myths inside of the book uh, where, you know, it's not a matter of any of that. It's a matter of what you do with the money you make. Do you remember either the moment or the mentor or something that made you believe, wait a second, this is for me too. Like, I think I can do this. Was it really just a gradual education or was there someone or something that made you believe that you could do it? You know, I've been on part of Dave's team for 15 years now, uh, but I have to say that it was connecting with his information mm -hmm. uh, and really look and see. Everybody, people will have the dream of becoming things. The thing that's missing is a plan, right? And you got to have a plan that works. And Dave inside of with Financial Peace University uh, has been that plan. It's helped over 6 million people beat debt, get out of get out of debt, build wealth, and be able to give. And so that plan was what was missing. And so being able to plug into it and to see it and to be able to follow something that you can track, well, that changes the game. It helps you to be able to not only know where you are, but also more importantly, remind you of where you want to go. Chris, that's funny that that's your answer because um, when I was in banking, I did really well. And I was also at the same time, young and arrogant and ignorant, I thought it would last forever. And I would always spend next year's money instead of yes. you know, taking care of my money. And there became a moment where I realized that I was in financial trouble before I actually had to lose everything and start all over again, right? You know, I, I think you kind of know for a while that it's coming, but you kind of deny it. And I started on my commute home every single night. I started listening to Dave Ramsey's show where everybody would call in and he'd you know, give them, here's how you're going to solve your solution, all that kind of thing. And it was that show and that education that started to make me comfortable with the idea that, okay, if I have to tear the Band-Aid off, if I have to swallow my ego, if I have to start all over again, then why not do it? And why not implement these things that you know this gentleman is talking about? So it's funny that that was your answer, the exposure to Dave in that show, because I think that's what gave me the courage to finally raise my hand and say, hey, babe, you know, we got to start over, lost yeah. my job, and... We're you know downsizing and starting a tiny apartment, and we're gonna we're gonna do a do over, so to speak. Yeah. Well, and that, that to me takes an incredible amount of maturity, right? To be able to not only acknowledge it, but to follow through with implementing, and that's what you did. And I'm I'm trying to encourage people out there. The last thing you want to do is keep driving down this dead end road. 
right? It's not going to lead you anywhere. And that's essentially what debt is. It's a, it's a thing that keeps taking. I was telling a group of uh, professional players, I, they bring me in to speak to the rookies, right? Before they get their first paycheck. And I was trying to explain to them about debt. And I was like, you know, it's like a frenemy, right? It's like this thing that you thought was your friend, and debt is. But then ultimately, you start to see it for what it is and realize this thing is not my friend. It's more of an enemy. All it does is take. And I said, if I can help people see that, and, and then I gave them a PhD in economics with this, Chris, you're going to love this. I said, all right, guys, here's the deal. I'm going to teach you economics right here. Interest that you pay is a penalty. If you borrow someone else's money, they charge you a penalty called interest. Interest that you earn, however, is a reward. So if you invest and save, your money grows, you're rewarded. I said, so what you want to do is let's avoid the penalties and increase the rewards. And I said, that's it. If you'll do that, I promise you, you'll put yourself on a path to becoming an everyday millionaire. I love and that. It's kind of looking at me and you could see the light bulbs flickering, trying to go off a little bit because they were taught to grow their FICO score, yeah. right? They're these guys. You got to go to FICO score. And you and I as bankers know that's the greatest farce in the banking industry. Okay. Right. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have anything. Right. It just means you're good with debt because FICO score measures how much debt you have, how well you've paid the debt, the type of debt you have, and the likelihood they're going to give you more debt. Okay. I'm not a rocket scientist, but there's a theme there and all the things deal with debt. Yep. I got to tell you, it's so, so, so funny. You talk about being a banker, you know, your FICO score and all that stuff. This is how the system is tilted against us. I bought a motorhome last week, ironically, that we're having this conversation right now. When I went in there, they said, well, here's the price and you can have it for 5,000 less if you finance it because they get a little kickback on the back end. Like, they, the whole system is set up to encourage you to go into debt. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the buy now, pay later mentality. Yep. Look at these jewelry store commercials, right? The 90 days, same as cash or two years, same as cash. You know, in the midst of this COVID crisis, I honestly saw car commercials that said, don't worry about the first six months payments. They're on us. And I'm thinking, seriously, people are unemployed and they're losing their jobs, but you're going to take care of the first six months payments. The, the, the balance isn't going anywhere. It just means you're deferring it. So I just want to help people wake up, learn to count, learn to see this stuff. And it doesn't mean that I don't want you to have stuff. I just don't want stuff to have you. So I want you to pay cash and be able to move forward so you can take care of yourself and your family. Okay, I love this. So let's talk to one specific person then real quick right now. Let's talk to the person who's fin a financial train wreck right now. Um, maybe even the person you brought up COVID who just got their butt kicked by COVID. They lost their job. They're in debt. No. Uh, they're scared. Or maybe just the person who's so far upside down that no matter what you and I teach them the rest of this episode, they're not going to believe that becoming a millionaire is for them. They're going to believe it's for everybody else. What do you have to say to that person? What I would tell them is, you know, you're walking through a tough time right now. Mm -hmm. And right now you can't really breathe. Because you feel like you've got just this, all this stuff wrapped around you and you can't see straight. What I want you to do is to sit down, take a deep breath, and let's start to pull these things off of you. And let's start to look at where you are and be honest. And I'd walk them through the AAA process that I came up with years ago. And the three A's are this, assess, acknowledge, activate, right? I want you to assess where it hurts right now. What are the things that are causing you stress or stealing your joy? And if it's debt, let's call it what it is, right? If it's a lack of income, let's call it what it is. Let's assess it. Next, I want you to acknowledge. Acknowledge that better is available. Acknowledge that if some of those things were to change, you are going to feel better. You are going to sleep better. Your relationships are going to be better, right? Acknowledge that. You got to be honest with yourself. And then the final step is activate. Let's activate a plan of action that starts to move you in that direction. You didn't get in debt overnight, okay? So we're not going to get out of debt overnight. But what we can do is systematically set up a plan that if you'll stick to it, if you wake up and make a decision each day, each and every day, and then stick to that plan, you will begin to clean this mess up because I've seen other people do it and I know you can too. Chris, I know your message is all about becoming that everyday millionaire through consistency, right? And I feel like there's two roads to becoming wealthy. Um, road one, be consistent, live frugally, invest conservatively. And in enough time, you'll end up a millionaire, right? A formula, like you were just saying. Yeah. Or option two, start companies. Some will work, some won't. But work your tail off, take risk, and end up a millionaire that way. Which way do you advise and why? Well, I think both ways are viable. I think most people are going to work for a company as opposed to starting their own. Uh, but I would encourage those people to still realize that being an entrepreneur is available to you. You can work 
with someone else, but then start something. If you've got a passion for it and a service and a product that can help people, it, it's an option for you. Uh, but I think a lot of people end up earning an income. And so it's really going to boil down to really being intentional about that. Utilizing these products that are the, you know, the number one wealth building tool all of these millionaires said they use to help them get to where they were, were employer sponsored retirement plans. I'm talking about 401ks and 403bs, IRAs and Roth IRAs. They, they invested. That was the number one tool. Now, we had people that built up companies and sold them and did a lot of things. But overarching, that was the tool that people used the most. So I say regardless of if you're an entrepreneur, you know, to me, entrepreneur, it, entrepreneurism is awesome, right? You don't have a ceiling in how much you can make. You get to decide and you can chase and make it happen. The problem is, is that it's not an income problem. It's a plan problem. You know, and you're taking it from someone that's made a lot of money over the years before I had a plan. Well, guess what? I got up and I made, I worked harder and I made more and I had more stuff and, and still didn't have anything to show for it. So the, you were there too. I yep. see in your hand. Yep. And this is a matter of get a plan now. This is my plea to your listeners and your viewers. I don't care if you make $25,000. Get a plan for that 25 right now. Don't pull a Hogan and say, I'm going to wait till I make 50. When I make 50, I'm going to get serious. That's a lie. Because here's the deal. If you can't handle 25, you're not going to handle 50. So let's handle the 25 really well. Now, when you get to making 50, what you're going to do is make more progress than you ever thought possible. Chris, I'm loving this. Do you think it's ever too late? You know, Someone might be listening right now saying, fine, if I'm 20s and my 30s, even if I'm 40, I see how this can work on my favorite. What if they're 60 and they're listening right now? Is it too late? No, it's not. It's never too late. Uh, you have an opportunity in front of you. And uh, you know, I tell people, if you've got breath in your lungs, you have opportunity. But what we have to do is make a decision. And it's easy. I talk about it in Everyday Millionaires, uh, that it's real easy to have this victim mentality. Right. And the victim mentality. And this is something you have to call out because this is real. We all can have it to some degree, whether you're, you want to be a victim about the family you were raised in or what they didn't teach you or how much money you didn't have growing up or about where you are now or whatever. And so I think we have to really call that out and look at why am I where I am? And if you're honest and real, what you say is because I put me here. Mm -hmm. And that's that ownership component. And I don't believe anybody gets better until they start to own where they are and how they got there. Because now you can start to decide what you're going to do to help you get out. And so I think that mentality is huge because that impacts what you believe. Mm, man, I love that. I agree. So the advice you give, it's proven. It's the real deal. But there's a lot of distractions out there right now. How do we decipher between all of the shiny fake millionaires all over social media that are that are given their advice and then the real advice such as given by you? Well, I think it really boils down to the proven plan. You know, I, I, there are a lot of people out there that are trying to teach people how to, to get rich, right? You'll see those late night commercials and those late night infomercials and, you know, just send them, you know, $495 for, you know, the next 25 years and they'll help you with this program. Listen, I want people to build wealth, mm -hmm. right? Getting rich happens fast and people lose it fast. When you build wealth, you're building it methodically and consistently over time. You're using things that you understand. Uh, you're working a plan that has your dream attached to it, so it matters to you. And so I think it's more a matter of looking at the proof. You know, we talked over 10,000 of them all across the country. So that means being a millionaire is not exclusive to where you live. It's not exclusive to where you went to school. Uh, it's not exclusive to how much you inherited from family. It boils down to you being intentional with your money. All right, so that brings up the next question then. You know, it doesn't matter where you're from, how you're raised, all that kind of thing. I want to ask you, we live in a time right now, as we're recording this, where there's a lot of conversation, deservedly so, about race and systemic racism and some of the challenges that Black entrepreneurs or Black people trying to build wealth face that others may not face. Um, and we're talking about a very true uh, wealth gap between mm -hmm. the black community and the rest of the world. So what are your thoughts around this? And how do we start to change that large gap in wealth? Well, I think the wealth gap is real. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, no doubt about it. And I think as you start to look at you know, the difference between African-Americans and, and Caucasians, uh, the income gap is real uh, just because of the, the opportunities 
have been really afforded more so to the Caucasian white side. Yeah. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that and to look at it and to see, well, why is that? What is the thing that's standing in the way? And, you know, as we look, and I've been really digging into this on the racism side of things and what's going on, but really racism really boils down to, to the heart. It's an issue of what's inside your heart based on either what you fear or what you fear could happen or has happened. And I think we it causes a lot of us to have to look inwardly and to think about that. Why do I feel the way that I feel? Um, I think it's important as a Christian to be able to, to look at this and understand we're supposed to love my brothers and sisters. And so this this is a real situation that's going on in our country right now. And the country is having to really deal with it and dig in and really talk about this. But I think the conversation is necessary. Um, I think the listening on both sides and communicating on both sides is absolutely necessary so you can gain understanding. It's impossible to care about or love anything you don't understand. And so I think that that conversation is necessary, but we also have to have some serious changes that happen and how business is transacted, how people are treated, uh, and the opportunities that are afforded to them as they move forward in life. Chris, there's the next question then. Uh, let's use myself as an example. How can someone like myself, what decisions or what actions should I be taking to help Black entrepreneurs or to help the Black community close that wealth gap? Well, I think, you know, whenever you have someone that asks me that, what can I do? I think having the conversations, being able to be aware, uh, being willing to, to guide a young entrepreneur. And I know you help people regardless of color. They can be purple or green. You, you have people's hearts in, in mind. You, you are helping individuals. So to you, I would tell you to keep doing what you've been doing, you know, but at the same time to reach out and to try to find those entrepreneurs, plugging into those groups, uh, being able to share some of the wisdom that you have, you know, this is a two-way street. Uh, it's going to have to be fixed by both sides. Uh, be willing to come together and to be willing to listen to each other and to hear each other. Uh, but more importantly, I think ultimately care for each other. You know, I think you asked me about giving and what's the best ways you can do it. I think it's with our time, talent, as well as with our money. You know, we all have talents that were God given, right? We, we think we are, we earned them, uh, but we're blessed to be able to do what we do. But having conversations with people, plugging into groups, giving people some guidance and advice, I think all of these things will begin to help people. Um, you know, I, I've taken it as my mission to get to try to change what people believe is possible. Yeah. Right. Regardless. And I see obstacles as a, as a proving ground. Uh, guys, so look at an obstacle. I'm going over it, under it, or through it. And I spent some time with some Navy SEALs. And so these guys, these are serious warriors. And that's how they think. You know, they expect an obstacle to pop up, right? They're not shocked by it. They expect something to pop up on the way to their mission that they're going to have to deal with. But the beautiful thing is they deal with it collectively, right? Everybody's prepared to handle it. And so when you get many hands dealing with the situation, what you get is solutions faster. And I think this is one of those situations where with many hands coming together, what we're going to do is to be able to solve this thing much faster than maybe we ever thought possible. I love that. It's, it's a collective. It's everybody has a responsibility to right. do their part in lifting up this conversation and taking action. I completely agree. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now, you mentioned generosity in there. I asked you about it earlier. On this show, we talk a ton about generosity. I believe it's a very important part of becoming and also then uh, you know, being wealthy. In your study of all these millionaires, 10,000 millionaires, what role or how often did you see generosity come up or play a role among them? Generosity was something that was very important. Uh, almost 70% of them were intentional in setting aside money each month to give. And whether, excuse me, whether that was through a church or a charitable organization or whatever, but they were very intentional with it. And I think that reveals a lot about the hearts. Uh, because a lot of people will try to point out that, you know, people that are wealthy are stingy. They don't like to give all this stuff. It's almost that Scrooge McDuck mentality. You know, I just dated myself again. Uh, like they're diving into the coin pool. That's exactly right. Which Even is, as a kid, I used to think, doesn't that, that would hurt. Like who wants to do that? <laughs> well, and, and the reality is, is they are giving, they are setting money aside. Uh, but I, I would encourage people, you know, your listeners and viewers out there, you don't have to wait to give. Uh, you've got opportunities. I talk about your talents, the thing that might come easy to you, 
Um, or if you've got a next door neighbor that's a single mom and she's got a couple of kids, you offering the babysit for her is giving her not only some time, the peace of mind, but also peace of heart, knowing her kids are safe for her to go have a dinner or to go have some time with friends. And so there are things that we can do. If you've got an elderly couple living next door, you know, you could pick up their groceries for them. You can text them or call them and find out and, and save them a trip uh, or cook a meal for someone. So I just think this generosity thing will help us change the face of this country a lot faster, but we have to be proactive and maybe not wait on people to ask, but let's take that first step toward meeting people halfway. I love that. You know, way in the beginning when we were doing rapid fire and, and I said, what's something generous you've done recently? You said, hey, I've, I've helped a couple of entrepreneurs or I've helped a couple of people with their, their finances. Can you recall a favorite moment of giving, whether it was your time, your expertise, where you saw it make a massive difference? Oh, I can tell you this. I talk about this story from stage, um, but uh, an opportunity I was with one of my boys. I do dad dates um, when they were younger and we'd go out. They love to go to certain restaurants and this restaurant, you could sit at the counter and watch them cook the food. And I love to cook and the boys are, you know, I've been intrigued by cooking at a young age. Well, we couldn't sit at the counter this time, but we got a table. And my son was a little bummed out, uh, but the waitress walked up and you can immediately tell she was pregnant. And I mean, pregnant, pregnant. Mm-hmm. And so I got a chance to talk to her, get to know her story. Turned out her fiance broke up with her after he found out she was pregnant. She was trying to work as long as she could before she went back home to have the baby. And I made the decision right then and there that I was going to leave a big tip. And so I, I try to get my son out. You can tell with my voice, I can't whisper. It's impossible. <laughs> I'm banned in 49 of the public libraries in America. (laughs) I can't whisper, but the bill came and I pulled out a a 20 to pay for the food and I pulled out another bill, a larger one, much larger to leave a tip. Well, my son sees this and you need to know the Hogan boys know how to count. They know money. And I was like, okay, buddy, it's time to go. He's like, no, dad, we got to wait on your change. That's (laughs) too much, right? So I eventually get him out of there, but we go to the side of the building. And we watched this lady walk up and pick up and see the 20 and the bill. And it would have been about a $6 tip. But when she saw the 50 underneath there, right? And I can remember standing at the side of that building. And if I think about it, I get emotional because I'd been telling my boys, it's good to give, it's good to give, it's good to give. But here in this moment, my son was able to see the impact of giving. And she picked up the 50 and put it to her heart and just started crying. And in that moment, I knew my son would be different in thinking about giving, that it wasn't just the thing that you do, but it's a two-way blessing, right? You bless the person that receives it, but also you as a giver. And so it was just one of those moments that was a game changer for him uh, because it, I, the next weekend, he was willing to put money into a charitable thing on his own. And so that, that story for me is kind of wraps it up in a nutshell. Parents, uncles, nieces, all of them. Let young people see you doing it. My friend Rachel Cruz says more is caught than taught, right? And so let them catch you doing some good stuff and watch what happens. And I love that. So your, your, your boys are growing up in a, a family with a dad that talks about money, talks about wealth. They're surrounded by people that teach about wealth, teach about money. How do you want them to view money growing up? I want them, I would love for my boys to see money as a tool. Uh, it's a tool to be able to build some incredible things uh, for people that are in need. Uh, it's a tool to allow you to enjoy some incredible things as an individual, but it also, it's more impactful for the things you can do with others. And so hopefully they get that lesson and I'm going to keep teaching it and keep teaching it and letting them see it and modeling it. And I think hopefully it'll hopefully one day stick. Oh man, I love it. Okay. I want to be respectful of your time. So just a couple quick questions uh, yet here. Talk to me about couples. One of the biggest stresses in any relationship is it always boils down to the finances many times. What advice do you have around communicating around money when it comes to couples? Well, I think for couples, the most important thing is to communicate. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is you all, you know, as a couple, you want to have some shared dreams together. You know, each individual is going to have their own dreams, the things that they want to accomplish. And I think it's important, uh, even as a married couple, for that individual to have their dreams and their goals. But it's going to be more impactful when you have these shared goals together, the things that you're working toward. And so being able to communicate is huge. You know, money fights are the second leading cause for divorce in North America. So if you can gain the language of being able to communicate with about money without fighting, it'll change it. You see, men see money as, as, a, uh, as a, uh, a provider, right? And, and so women view money as more about security. 
And so if there's a lack of money, you got a man that's not feeling that he's worth much and you have a woman that could be scared. Yeah. And those could easily flip flop. But on the whole, that's what it boils down to. Well, that's a powder keg of emotion right now. And so if you don't have the language to be able to talk about it, what will end up happening is, is now a little statement can turn into a big fight and big fights can end up turning into larger divides in the relationship. What if one of the person, one of the people in the relationship is the spender and the other is the super conservative uh, saver and, and pretend both to a fault, like an addiction? How well, do you work that out? Well, here's the thing. We all know God has to have a sense of humor. Uh -huh. right? Because you tend to attract it to someone that's opposite of you. And so typically you will have someone that's a super saver and you can have someone that's a super spender. I would say that on both sides, neither side is correct. What they need to do is blend, right? And there needs to be money that is enjoyed, but we also need to save. And so it's really coming up with your, your new plan together. The problem is, is that if we don't learn about money, we're left to our own devices. Mm -hmm. And so you've got people that are single for several years before they get connected. By then, you've already established some of the bad habits, or maybe you have some of the good ones. But the big thing is, is working together. I think that's been the, the massive impact of financial peace, to be able to help people have that common language, learn those common goals, and more importantly, share in a common plan. Man, I love that. So, you know, my wife and I are both entrepreneurs, and one of the best parts of our marriage over the past, gosh, more than a decade now has been chasing down goals together. So when you say you have to have those goals, you have to have that plan. That when we go on walks, when we go on rides, when we're hanging out, it's one of our favorite things to bond over is chasing down these goals, talking about these goals, tracking these goals. It's a, it's, I think it's a must. No, I think it is too. You all have nailed down a secret and that is that working together as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you can overcome anything. Uh, you can chase down. I love that chasing down dreams together. And so again, but I, I would urge couples out there, being a couple doesn't mean that you surrender your identity, right? You still have who you are and the things that you enjoy. And so does your spouse. Uh, but the key is, is being able to support each other, being able to see that, to be able to work together, to extend grace, to have understanding, but also to be able to support. See, we, we're all good at wanting to be supported. Some people aren't as good as giving support. And so that's the thing that you have to work on. And you got to make sure that this is thing, you don't ever put it on cruise control. And it's a thing that you've got to stay connected to. You got to keep your hand on the wheels of your money and the relationship all throughout. I love that. No self-driving Tesla when it comes to relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Not Chris, at all. Listen, this has been so valuable. I know people want more. Where should they follow you? Where should they check out the books? And what programs should they be checking out? Well, I appreciate the time with you. Uh, they can learn all things more about me at my website, chrishogan360.com. There's information on there about articles and blogs, information about the Chris Hogan Show, which I'd love for them to come listen to. Uh, also, I've got a YouTube channel that they can watch. Uh, I'm as animated there as I've been here and I have a lot of fun. Uh, but no, chrishogan360.com, chrishogan360.com. I love it. We'll put links in the show notes to everything. I'm a huge fan of the way you show up and the way you teach. So we'll make sure that they get that, you know, let's say, um, in abundance. That's for sure. Okay, that's last, last question for you before uh, we go here. Um, give me a reason why people should be unapologetic about their pursuit of building wealth like you teach. Well, I think, you know, I, I don't think you ever have to apologize for winning. I've never watched the team win a Super Bowl and say that I'm sorry. I've never watched the team hoist the Stanley Cup or the NBA trophy and say, you know, I'm sorry, we won. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think, I think the same is said with money, that as you work hard, uh, that there's nothing wrong with you having some fun and enjoying it. Uh, but it's important for us to have the right spirit, uh, to be a giver, to share in that. But there's nothing wrong with winning. And I, I think, you know, we live in a country that we have an opportunity to decide and try within the same minute. Yep. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to decide that we want better for ourselves and our family and that we're going to not just try, but I'm going to keep trying day in and day out. And so I want to encourage people out there, don't you dare apologize for being successful. I want you to enjoy it. And I think that's the fruit that comes from laboring hard. Oh, man, I love it. What a perfect answer to put a bow on this thing, Chris. 
from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your energy. Thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for the way that you show up so consistently. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing for the world and, and know how valuable this time was. Well, I appreciate you and keep up the good work. Keep shedding light and the right information out there for people. I think it's important for us as coaches to keep encouraging people to believe that they can and they should. I promise to. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.